So we're going to do a little bit of a fireside chat. One of the things I was going to ask Lincoln is, uh, what are the two goals of customer success? And so does anyone want to take a stab at it and kind of share their self-belief in what are the two goals for customer success? One is to uh, build a customer-centric culture throughout the company. And the second is to provide value to our customers through our products. Making sure your customers are, your new customers are happy from the beginning. And secondly, they're happy for a long, long time and keep paying you. Now, what's your perspective? You write a lot of blogs about customer success. For me, customer success has, there's two goals. One is to make sure the customer is successful. successful. Make sure they achieve their desired outcome. That's number one. Number two, is make sure that if they don't, they don't blame you. So what I mean by that is, we need to set up our, our customers with everything we can we can to make them successful, but there are things that are outside the scope of our relationship with the customer. But there, those things still have to happen for the customer to actually get value out of your product, or out of your service, or whatever it is that you are selling to them. So I may have all the features and functionality required and a customer could go through all of the all of the required steps, functionally complete uh, their use of the product and still come out the other end not having achieved their desired outcome. So think about, uh, the example I always give is like email marketing software. I can build a list, I can upload a list, I can write an email, I can send that email, and it looks like I'm doing what I need to do. But if nobody reads those emails, or everybody unsubscribes, or nobody clicks the link, nobody comes to my event, I'm not actually successful. And I'm probably not gonna take the blame for that. I'm gonna think your product sucks, and I'm gonna go switch to your competitor. And what we wanna do is in situations like that, I wanna, I wanna set everything up as much as I can to make the customer successful, guide them through that process, do whatever it takes, but I also want to let them know that there's a lot that they have to do to be successful. They have to know how to write a good email, using that example. They have to know how to write a headline. You know, maybe I can, I can start to build some stuff into the product, use AI and machine learning and try to come up with, with suggestions for them. But they have to know what they're doing to a certain extent. Otherwise, they're not going to get the value that they want out of that product. So I want... You know, my main goal is to make sure that every single customer gets exactly what they need out of, out of the, their relationship with our company, but secondarily, I want to make sure that if they don't, they just don't blame us. And that's not just, I mean, that's not just being funny or, or you know, kind of saying, you're trying to offload the blame. It's actually, it's actually really good. If the customer doesn't blame us, then they're not going to churn they might actually say, you know what, you're right. It wasn't the vendor, it wasn't you, it was us. It was on, on us as the customer. So maybe next quarter we'll actually try. You know, maybe this coming quarter we'll actually put in the effort that's necessary to be successful. So it's, it's about setting them up for success. And if they don't take the right action, well, at least they know that it was on them. They didn't take the action. Sounds like you're promoting customer accountability and educating them on what re it really takes in order to be successful with your system. And how many of us have seen customers that don't have the framework in place from a business standpoint and they think that if they buy your system, now everything is going to work. This is, this is how they're gonna get better at support, get better at sales, get better at marketing. Whereas in fact, we know that there's a lot of things that they need to change in their own organization. And I think what you're hearing you say is that customer success managers have the responsibility to educate the client around what does it really take to be successful. Yes, question, comment. Nobody likes it when I say this, especially yeah. people in sales. I think it's the responsibility of sales to have that conversation, mm -hmm. to make sure that the fit is appropriate because what happens if the CUSM, now the customer's bought the product, the salesperson never said any of this stuff, now the CSM is telling them all this stuff, mm -hmm. and they're thinking, why the hell didn't the sales guy tell me this stuff? Because now I have way more work to do than I thought I did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would disagree. I would say it was the customer success organization's responsibility to have a checkpoint in place 
for the during the sales process to see if it is a good fit so it never comes down to stream to them in the first place. Because the salesperson's job is going to try to sell, sell, sell. So as a mature customer success organization, put that checkpoint checkpoint process in place because you're the one that's going to suffer from it. So but you're the but one. here's the rub, and that's why I preface my statement with salespeople don't want to hear this. You do anything to slow the, the sales guy's sales cycle? If a CUSM comes in and starts having this readiness conversation I with would the customer, the and it slows the sales cycle, the salesperson is not going to like that. This is, this is a discussion in a, a function between the executive team, not the CSM, and the salespeople. Sure. Well, we're going to assume that, just for the sake of the assumption, that what Lincoln just said is applicable also for the ideal customer, not just the wrong customer. So even if the ideal customer walks into the door, the CSM's responsibility is to ensure that the client knows what is their accountability or what is, the, what is the roadmap and the changes that they need to make in their own organization to be successful with the system, regardless whether the customer is ideal or wrong for you. Do, do you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you got to get clear on what a bad fit customer looks like. And, and if you look on 16ventures.com, I have something about success potential. There's six different inputs into figuring that out. You got to get clear on that. We can't solve upstream problems downstream, so we can't be trying to make bad fit customers successful. It just doesn't work. It wastes time. If you're dealing with that right now, figure out what success potential looks like. Start to quantify that by actually keeping track of your time, the time spent dealing with customers that would that you would identify as bad fit. You can look at churn customers. How many of those were uh, bad fit? You can go look at your existing sales pipeline or anything that's coming in from marketing and see how many of those are bad fit. Look at your existing customers, how many of those are a bad fit, and you start to get a pretty good idea what's gonna happen in the future. I, I actually, I agree with both of you guys. Uh, this needs to be built into the sales process. Uh, we can start teeing these things up. There's a concept that I, that I use that I call orchestration, and it's probably one of the most important things that you could do. It really comes down to managing expectations. Uh, and honestly, if we just did that better in our own lives, not just with our customers, things would probably be better. And this doesn't take technology, it doesn't take you know any magical, AI or programming or whatever, just start letting your customers know this is what's gonna happen down down the road. So a salesperson can start to lay that out. Hey, are you gonna be the person that start, that implements this? No, okay, cool, why don't you connect me with that person, I'll get our CSM involved now. Sometimes, and we see this, I don't have empirical evidence on this, but you know, in my experience, you get a CSM involved earlier in, during the sales cycle in some way, sales cycles often have a, have a tendency to, to be a little bit shorter. That makes salespeople happy. No salesperson is going to say, oh, hey, uh, no, don't get involved. I don't want my sales to, to close faster. Like, that's not going to work. That's not ever going to happen. So if you can come in and, and say something that's meaningful to them, and then you can deliver on that, now they trust you. So if you go to a sales, sales organization and say, look, you know, let us vet your, your pipeline, not, for, you know, not to try to keep you from closing sales, but to see where we might be able to help you. You know, we can look in there, and we can see some characteristics about those customers, and we can provide some, some guidance. You know, maybe hey, ask them this question. Use this language. Set up a meeting with us and and them if it's a if it makes sense financially for that type of customer. So there's a lot you can do, and then you know the reality is this though, even in the B two B world, people especially maybe in a B two B world, people buy based on they buy based on emotion still. I mean, and then they then they look for logic to to sort of justify that purchase. So we tend to forget that, and we think everything that they heard during the sales process, they're gonna remember when they become a customer, and that's like not true at all. So you know, we have a huge opportunity to, to either pick up the ball and run with it or completely drop it right after the customer becomes a customer. It's a moment I call the WTF moment. It's when the customer can you know, either go, oh, this was the best decision I've ever made, I, the the political and social capital I invested in this internally in the company is, is was well you know m in investment that's going to get a great ROI or they can be like what the fuck just happened and we don't want our customers to do that we you know we want to make sure that we we as the customer is going through the sales process that we just pick it up and run with it once they become that customer and so anything we can do along the way. To, to reduce friction, to set them up, to orchestrate what's gonna happen after they become a customer is great. The other thing to remember is the more, the more complex the customer, the more you know, they have a change management issue on their end. And if you can start to bring, you know, bring things up during the sales cycle, even you know, if it's a salesperson just kind of bringing in a customer success person who really only does sales stuff, 
but they sort of still sit under customer success. CSMs can ask questions that salespeople can't. They're going to get answers that salespeople won't get. And they can go in and it's a presumptive close. Like, this is what we're going to do. Salespeople can try to use that language, but it's a, it's a little off-putting. It's like, whoa, 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 you know, I, do, I didn't agree to anything. CSM comes in and says, this is what the first 30, 60, 90 days look like. Boom, done. All right, cool. Now I can go back and start planning. It's no surprises. If we don't tell people things, they start to use their imagination. Now, how often is this implemented? It's, as, it's implemented as often as I get the opportunity to implement it. So, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not an analyst. I don't have empirical evidence across a huge swath of, of companies outside of those that I work with. So in the companies where, where we do this stuff, it tends to have really great results. The sales cycles tend to get shorter. Churn tends to go down. That's the goal. I've never seen it where it has anything but a, a positive impact. I agree. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it's. Yeah. I would love to see like a really big empirical study on this, but I don't know of one. The only negative impact I've ever seen, and it's actually a positive, is that you sometimes your business will go down if you don't have a good product market fit, and you're um, that, yeah. so that's a different problem. I mean, there's yeah, there's there's some baseline stuff we have to have in place here, right? So I mean, I'm making some assumptions that you have a good product that people actually want to buy. I mean, so that's a good point, though. I mean, if if you start trying to go through the process of nailing down who your ideal customer is and getting deliberate in your growth and all that stuff, you might find that at some point you actually don't have it right. Okay. You know, so, so that's possible, definitely. So may I ask you, what is your definition of customer success given these goals and yeah. all these different feedback? So the definition that I've landed on at this point, and it's evolved over the years, I've had this one for a little while, is the customer success is when your customers achieve their desired outcome through their interactions with your company. Now, don't overthink that concept. And if you tell people that concept, you know, remind them not to overthink it. It's very simple. The implementation of it, it's a whole different story. But the concept is relatively simple. Now, there's a couple things in there that we need to unpack. One is through the interactions with your company. And that's really critical. I, I said this for maybe a couple weeks, then I caught myself. I said, it's through the use of your product. And I'm like, oh, actually, that's not true at all. It's through all of the interactions across the entire life cycle. And that's, that's really important to remember. It's from the first interactions with, with marketing and sales, through, through any sort of pre-sales work, through onboarding, through procurement, you know, how they buy across the entire journey. And, and so you know, the vast majority of their interactions with you may be through the product, but there are other things going on. And we need to just take all of those things into consideration. Probably there are going to be certain phases of the life cycle where there's more in-depth interaction, onboarding, you know, tends to be the main focus. But across the life cycle, there's going to be times where they're going to have deeper interactions with you. And you need to, te to really keep those things in mind. The other thing is desired outcome. Desired outcome is made up of two pieces, and that's required outcome and uh, appropriate experience. And... It's, it's just what your customer needs to achieve. It's their business outcome. It's the thing that they have to have. If you don't even solve for that, like you're not in the game. Most tech companies, I think at least start out certainly, but a lot still do focus on only that. And so you say, I have all the functionality, you know, we have all the features, we have feature parity with our competitors, whatever. Why are our customers leaving? <laughs> you know? So that's required outcome. And then you have appropriate experience. So that's what your customers, and how they need to achieve it. So they, the goal, the required outcome, Appropriate experience is how they need to achieve it. You need both of those things if you want your customers to, and there's a, here's a, a bad word when it comes to, it's the F word when it comes to data-driven people. Your customers need to feel successful. <laughs> but feel, feel is a word that people don't like, you know, like, oh, I want to be all data-driven. But this is, feel is something that's quantifiable. I can check boxes and I can say, I didn't have this, I didn't have this, I didn't have this, so I didn't feel successful. So what it really comes down to the experience side of things. You know, so there's two types of loyalty, right? So a customer that's loyal to you because you're just the product they're using right now. The, the example that I always give is the, you know, there's a store right by your house. Probably everybody has this experience. There's a store right by your house that you go to because it's right by your house. You don't really like it. It's just convenient. It's just where you go. When you really want to buy something cool, you go, you know, you, when you go across town to Whole Foods or something. But you go to this little stupid store. But what if a store opened up across the street or an equally uh, convenient area that was better? You'd go there, right? We don't want to be that to our customers because it's very easy for them to, at some point, 
make the switch. We want to be something more like the example I just gave, Whole Foods. There was a time, kids, there was a time when Whole Foods had you know fans and people people really talked about it in a special way, a lot more than just a grocery store. And so you would make it a destination. You would go there, you were loyal to it because of something. And that something was the experience. Even if you were going there to literally buy the same thing that you could get at that little store by your house. So we want we want our customers to be that. I'll tell you a quick just a quick little story on that. I was doing a workshop in Austin a couple weeks ago and we were all standing around afterwards and, and we had our phones out, everybody had the iPhone. And I don't think anybody had the newest one. And they were like, somebody said, hey, you know, would, would any of you ever consider getting an Android? And I, and I said, yeah, you know, maybe. And I'm like, whoa, that's crazy because I was like an Apple fanboy. Like I, I had everything to do with Apple. And just some things that have happened lately have kind of hurt the experience for me. Maybe functionality-wise, it's still there, but like just certain things. And I'm, I'm at a point where I'm kind of locked in to their ecosystem, and that's what's keeping me. But if enough bad stuff happens, like maybe I make that switch. And that's just a really interesting thing. So you know, just because you're able to you know get your customers to be attitudinally loyal to you because you provide both the required outcome and the appropriate experience, don't think you can just rest on that. Either their experience might their their appropriate experience might change, or you might let something slip, and then all of a sudden it's not the appropriate experience anymore. And now they're thinking, yeah, you know what? There's other there's other stuff out there that we could be going after. Well, you talk about desired outcomes and you talk about appropriate experience. Can you talk a little bit about how do you define desired outcome? And also, if you can expand a little bit, when you work with your clients, how do you help them think through how to measure whether or not they have achieved or proven uh, the value or achieved the desired outcome? And also, the appropriate experience. When it comes to required outcome, that's what we need to remember that that's what, what we're focused on is the actual outcome for the customer. So I, I was listening to all the stuff, all the discussion earlier, and there was a lot of discussion around measuring outcomes that had nothing to do with actually measuring outcomes. It was all about the use of the product to some degree, and and to me that's not surprising. But if somebody doesn't buy your product to use it. Sorry, they, they buy it or they subscribe to it or whatever it is, whether it's your product or your service, they do business with you to get an outcome. And if you don't deliver that outcome at some point, very quickly, probably, they're going to start seeing that there's something not working here. So you have to understand what, it, what is required for them to actually get value. So the number one input into customer health. I call it success vector. I try to look at, you know, I want to look at something that's a little bit more forward looking. Customer health tends to be just kind of a point in time. So I'm, I want something that says, what's the likelihood that a customer is going to stay or, or not stay, or if they do stay, they're going to grow. And the number one input into, into that, or just any other measure, I don't care, needs to be, are the things that are, that are necessary to get value being done? So it's important that we understand what they need to do and are they doing it. But what's interesting is that's usually two things. One, that's usually not being measured. We don't really even know what those things are. And two, that's usually something I get a lot of pushback on. Oh, that's hard. I don't know how to do that. Cool. Let's figure that out. And it is hard. To define the outcomes or define no, what, they figure out what they need to do. They need to do. Yeah, I mean, it's not hard. It's just it's a process we have to go through. But a lot of times people, it's almost a non-starter. I don't even want to talk about that. Let's talk about processes. Let's talk about data. What processes are you doing? If, you, if your processes, if you have processes in place and you don't know what it takes for your customer to be successful, what processes do you have in place? I don't know what you're doing. If you're doing something. You're working really hard at it, but it's not really customer success. But here's, here's the thing about, and we kind of need to know where we, where we come from, I think. A lot of customer success comes from account management. And so traditional account management was like, here's a book of business. You, CSM, get $2 million in ARR across this many customers. There you go. Uh, make sure they pay their bill. Uh, make sure that they renew. 
And if you can, make sure they buy more. Cool. Go after it. That worked in a, in a world where you didn't have to actually make the customer successful. You didn't have to actually try to get them to do things. Uh, that model doesn't really work when you, when you add in the piece about actually making your customer successful. So we need to understand what it takes for them to be successful and operationalize around that, which quickly goes to something that came up earlier. It's like, well, I don't know if I said it, but was, you know, our, we're kind of looking at like all of our customers are the same. Well, right. As soon as you start getting into this process of like, what do our customers need to do to be successful? You realize they, they don't all need to do the same things. Well, right. So they're not all they're not all the same. We need to look at it that way, which is where appropriate experience really comes in. If we have this, if we have customers that sort of all share the same required outcome, the differentiator between those or the what you would segment based on should probably be their appropriate experience, because that's also going to tell you what kind of coverage you need to give them. You don't need to have the same level of coverage for one customer, uh, you know, that requires one-on-one -on -one meetings, QBRs. Uh, you need to fly out and take them to, to a steak dinner and you know another type of customers everything is self-service if you don't understand that you're going to probably over optimize or over deliver for some customers and that's what you see a lot of you see customer you see customer success organizations that start out with the, really that account based account management way of looking at it a couple of years later they've thrown they've thrown body as a solution um, and they, they hit some point where they can't scale or it's just costing too much to scale or whatever or churn goes up and they're like, I don't understand. We're giving everybody a lot of coverage, a lot of human interaction, but they don't understand what their customers actually need to be successful. So number one, figure that out. Number two, are they doing those things or are those things being done? Okay, so I want to take a step back and just talk about the definition of business outcomes or desired outcomes. Can you give the audience an example of a really good uh, example of a desired outcome being defined with a client and maybe like one that does not qualify well, I mean, or bad one. yeah, anything that's that's inward looking. Any, I mean, it, if it's if it's about if it's not about your customer, it's not their desired outcome. Um, and so, anything that has to do with your product, using your product, that anything that isn't about their their business, you're probably looking at it the wrong way. So, if they say their business outcome is to deploy the software across the organization, that's right. not a desired outcome. No, and that's that's the thing. If we ask our customer. Hey, you know, what's your desired outcome with our software? Oh, I want to make sure that we have all 100 licenses you know, right. up and running in the next 90 days. Cool. <laughs> mm -hmm. But why did you actually buy it? And the thing is, if I'm talking to the administrator, mm -hmm. uh, that might actually be their desired outcome. Right. So we might have a situation where we have customers that are very large that have different personas in, in, in the company. So yeah, individual personas may have those individual goals, but but an executive, as, can you give an example? Of yeah, that? I mean, uh, well, I want more revenue. I want more people to my events. I want uh, just stuff like that. You know. Yeah, um, in my experience, is either you help them increase revenue, or you help them decrease cost. Just overly simplified, of course. Does anybody object to that or think about something else? Avoid oh, risk. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Which is saving Save. money. Yeah, there's nothing else. Yes. To all of that, except I would just I would say you need to make sure so this is why if you if you're selling a, a sort of horizontal product and you sell into healthcare and you sell into something else that isn't healthcare, <laughs> cybersecurity, you're probably going to talk about that cost saving in a different way, right. right? And so that's why at the very least we need to understand that our customers are different, and we need to you know understand if if they have certain customer segments that have. We're just talking about domain specific language earlier you know things that really resonate uh with with certain customers you know you might find this is gonna, not going to make me popular here but you know there are times where the best course of action uh is not going out and finding people with, with customer success experience but actually finding people with domain experience and teaching them customer success best practices because you can teach that stuff you can't teach experience and sometimes depending upon the customer segment that experience is more important than anything else we talk about desired outcome let's suppose we already defined them with the client what are the key requirements to actually measuring outcomes so I mean I, I'm gonna sound like a broken record but the number one thing is are the customers and are we doing the things that are necessary to, to be successful because I don't so I don't think anything that was brought up earlier was wrong I just think if we're looking at you know some of the the standard inputs of you know 
trouble tickets? Are they being resolved? And are they paying their bills? And all this other stuff. That's cool. That's good. But none of that actually matters unless they're successful. Well, maybe they're paying the bills. But if they're not getting out of it what they need, uh, this is a problem. One of the things that I see a lot of, especially with SaaS companies, is an over-reliance on usage data and just this idea that activity is, is meaningful. So going back to that you know, really simple email marketing idea of they did these three or four things and, and that should indicate that they were able to send an email and, and that's, that's cool. They did what they needed to do. But the reality is there was a reason they signed up. So to the extent possible, I also want, I, I would love for you to be able to figure out this can be inferred through the actions that your customers take, especially as they really as they sign up, you can figure out what their initial sort of use case was. If you're in a higher touch situation, you can actually ask what their goals are and then know what do they need to do to reach the outcome associated with that goal. If a customer tells me that they need to increase revenue by 20%, all right, cool. That may be different than a, a customer that's using the same product but needs to just be in compliance. They're, they're two different ways of moving forward. So a company I'm working with right now is in the real estate world and, and a very simple way of looking at things with them is we came up with, are they new agents? Are they existing agents with you know, switching from another product? Are they existing agents using a, this type of product for the first time? Each of those types of customers are going to require something different. And then there's another, another input is what's their initial goal? So right there, you have several different ways that you would work with the customer when they first become a customer. And that's so simple, that didn't take a lot of analysis. They already knew their customers. Those were some simple ideas that they just pulled out. You could do that right now. That doesn't require a lot of excess work. Let me ask you a question. Because I think about outcomes as two things. One, you have to achieve them, and two, you have to get them to recognize it, right? You can be crushing it, and if the right people don't know, it doesn't matter. Okay. But I've run into the situation where the desired outcomes Increases in revenue, market share, how quickly they bring products to market, they don't want to share. They don't want to share that. Okay. Yeah, it's like okay, cool. cool. So, in that situation, I don't need to know details. I might just ask them, yeah, are you guys, have you done, I might even be able to see, it looks like you've done these different projects. You know, we don't know what those are, but I just want to make sure that those are, you're feeling confident, you know, going forward. So, that's, I mean, that's an awesome example. Yeah, and do they you feel? Know, feel. I, I, baseline, I baseline and just tell you, like, are you moving off the baseline? Right? Yeah. I mean, you expect to improve by 20%. I don't care what the numbers are. Right, but right. I'm always looking for different ways to do it. I, yeah, I mean, I want to know what your, I, I, to the extent possible, I want to know as specifically as possible what your goal is. But yeah, I mean, if you tell me you guys have an internal goal and you tell me that you met it, you know, the only thing I, I can do is, is take your word for it at that point. I might, I'm going to try my best to look at other data points to maybe quantify that. But, I mean, that's that's an awesome example of, of probably an, an atypical use case. I mean, I think a lot of people aren't so protective of, of certain things, especially in systems that they trust. Um, but this is another key point just to, just to understand where you fit in your customer's universe. So going to the other, or how do we know this? How do we figure out what this stuff is? Obviously, you need to know your customer better than you know themselves. So you need to spend time with your customers. How many people in here have spent time with your customers in the last six months not showing them your product, not even asking them questions, just observing them? So you or somebody from your company. And not through a screen. It's about 30% raised their hands before, and now I see about... I don't know, 25%. That's 25%. good. That's awesome. That's very cool. That's... That's pretty rare, actually. So for the rest of you, no, but really what you want to do is make sure that you, you, it's your job to know your customers better than they know themselves. And so I want to spend time with customers. I want, to, I want to observe. I want to understand that when a customer first becomes a customer, I might not be at the center of their universe. And that's okay. So going back to sort of orchestration, setting things up, letting them know where we, you know, what they need to do. Recognizing that I'm not going to drop everything on them on day one. I might start you know, kind of say, again, here's what the first 90 days look like and kind of feed them the right things. Something else that came up earlier was, was I heard a lot of time-based things. I, mean, I, I couldn't tell if, if a couple people who said this were being kind of sarcastic or, or not. Um, but, you know, after 30 days, somebody's on board, you know, we, we take an action. I will tell you, I mean, I've seen, I've gone into, situ into situations where that's actually exactly what's going on. At 30 days, we mark them on board 
and now they're on to the next phase. That, that's not true. So, you know, we need to understand these, well, what I call success milestones. So understanding where the customer is going, what, what they need to do to be successful. And along the way, what are the things, you know, sort of the, the milestones that matter. And those, you know, they're, they're not time-based. People will say, but that seems, you know, they'll, they'll have a reason for it. 90 days, that's logical. Yeah, to you. I mean, it sounds like a nice number. But it means nothing to the customer, right? One thing I would tell you guys to do is decouple success from a contract. So, you know, if you sign a one year contract, that's great. Congratulations. It has nothing to do with their success and it has really nothing to do with their renewal. I mean, you have some timing there based around that renewal. But, you know, if they're, if, so to your point, you know, if they're six months in and they've only met half their goal or they haven't even gotten value yet, but they're, you know, they're taking a little bit longer. We need to be transparent with them. We need to let them know you're six months away from a renewal, but based on your current trajectory, you know, you're eight months away from really getting value, whatever that value is. So that means we need to start letting everybody know that when renewal time comes, you need to let that happen because you're on the right track to getting value. But a lot of people hide from those, those conversations. And so again, just really laying out everything that has to happen with the customer on, on their side, on our side, who's responsible, Lay all that out, and then you can start operationalizing around that. And that observing your customers, looking to adjacent products to figure out, and adjacent products to you. So, or, or products that you would integrate with, or no, actually, that you, you I would sell. say maybe I'm saying you wrong. Say adjacent, yeah, products that are being sold into the same part of the company around the same price point from you or from your from from other the from other other vendors, not necessarily competitors, okay. um, because they're probably not going to use you and Man. somebody else but they're gonna use other products that are maybe a similar price, sold into the same part of the organization. If you sell a point solution, don't try to, don't go compare yourself to a you know, mission critical ERP or something like that. But you wanna know based on that, you know, or if you look at that, you're gonna know sort of what their expectations are in working with vendors like that. And then you can start asking them questions like, oh, you know your customer uses this other product. So well, what, what, what don't you like about that? about that company they're not a competitor there's nothing there's nothing competitive there so they they shouldn't feel weird telling you these things and you say well what do you like or what do, you know what don't you like and you'll start understanding more about what the experience is that they would prefer and so if they say well this other vendor doesn't spend any time with us but, you know everything's self-service hmm. so they might have an expectation or what their experience what their appropriate experience would be would be a little bit higher touch and then you have to make the decision well they don't pay us very much. We can't give them a higher touch experience. And, you know, what that means is they're a bad fit customer. We shouldn't be doing business with them. What most companies would do is just say, well, we'll give them the same crappy experience that the other vendor does. And then they wonder why there's a lot of churn in that particular customer segment. So we have to really understand our cust the customer lifecycle to the best of your ability, but that requires you first getting really clear on the customer segments, which ideally should be based on what their appropriate experience is. It's not easy, I mean, it's a, it's a process, but it's, it requires work. I'm trying to think about the adjacent products that you, I think it's a really smart comment. One of the things that I'm, I'm thinking about is, could the client expectations around appropriate experience for them be fused by how, you know, the type of experience that they're getting from the adjacent products in the market, setting up the bar for you, and that is why it is important for you as a as a vendor that or yeah. as a solution that plays in that e ecosystem, if you will, to understand what type of experience your customers might expect, so that you don't so you can be proactive about the type of engagement model you give them and prevent churn proactively. Yeah. That what, well, that and that's that's exactly it. So, and and you know, you can talk to you can actually reach out to the customers of those other products. It's if, if your customers use those products, you can talk to them about it. You can reach out to customers with those other products. A lot of people, a lot of companies like to put their customers right there on their website, so you can go reach out. Um, you might have a third party do it if you don't want to want anybody to know what you're doing. But it's really interesting. You start digging in, and you might find though that yeah, this is what's going on in the market, but nobody likes it, and so nobody feels successful. So you get to come in and actually do something different, do what's right, and and so at the very least, leverage compared. So not only 
inquire about products that are not your competitors, but you can actually find out what is the experience that your competitors yeah. even give one up if you, you're looking for that competitive advantage uh, yep. to provide to your clients in terms of the appropriate experience and maybe a better experience. Yeah, I mean, you could also go look at, you know, look at review sites and stuff like that of your competitors and see what they're saying. Look at what they say about you. I mean, you know, try to look objectively at that. There's something I call uh, latent AX. So I, I say AX for appropriate experience. And there's this idea of latent AX, which was, which is something that a lot of vendors have been able to tap into knowingly or unknowingly. So you look at something like Airbnb, there was a latent AX out there that was like the appropriate experience for people was not corporate hotels, um, but there wasn't really another option. And so Airbnb said, you know, we think there's something there and they tried some stuff and it worked and they sort of unlocked this latent uh, appropriate experience. And you see that with lots of different vendors uh, in lots of different areas. Tesla, you know, is like kind of redefining what a car is. So there's lots of lots of opportunity there to make that not just your competitive advantage, but you know the whole reason you exist in the market as being like we're coming in with the appropriate experience for this particular market segment. And if it's like Airbnb or or even Tesla, you know it's a small segment at first, but then that starts to spread. People say, you know what, I just had a great experience. Do you know with this? I, I stayed in a really cool apartment in downtown San Francisco. I got out of the the really crappy hotels, like. Okay, cool. That's awesome. They start spreading the word around that, and now you start to build momentum. So there's always a possibility that you could find something like that. So tell me, what is the most important thing to measure to ensure that you're driving customers towards business outcomes? I think I've already said it like a, a million times, but <laughs> are the things that need to be happening happening? You know, are, are the customers doing what they need to be doing? Are we doing what we need to be doing? Are the joint accountabilities being held up? If, you, if you're not measuring that, um, I mean, you're measuring something, that's great. But, you know, this is why you see things like NPS, you know, uh, companies have really high NPS and a lot of churn. Okay, cool. Why? Well, that doesn't actually measure anything to do with what, what's actually going on. It's, it's M NPS, if, I, if I'm going to weight it in any way, I mean, that, that's, to me, that's on the appropriate experience side of things. And you can actually have fans that aren't customers, right? I mean, there's, oh, I, I, I love that vendor. I'm not a customer. Well, I mean, that's cool, but ultimately we're talking about customers here. And, you know, unless we're a big consumer brand, uh, we probably want most of those fans to actually be doing business with us. So you gotta make sure that, are the things that, are, that need to be happening, happening. And then the other stuff you can start bringing in. So, I mean, we're talking about how many data points do you need? Again, I don't think I heard anything that was wrong earlier. I, I think that, uh, I do think that trying to boil it down to some sort of scores, maybe just trying to optimize for the wrong thing in a lot of cases, but I don't, so I don't know of a, of a particular number that matters. Uh, all I know is that if it's not based on what's actually going on with the customer, then, then it doesn't matter. You're talking about an inside view versus an outside? Like yeah. That? Yeah. Um, an inside view of what's going on with the customer. Though. Yes. Yeah. Gonna open it up for a question. Yes, Joe, right? Yeah, I was just gonna say, I mean, wouldn't the most important metric for measuring outcomes is whatever metric the customer is gonna use to determine whether right. they achieve the outcome or not? Yeah, ultimately, but we do want to try to get ahead of these things, right? So if, sure. if I know what your goal is and we we say that in six months you're gonna reach that goal, cool. It, do I wait till six months and ask you? You know, no, we try to try to figure out what they need to do to get there. So figure out what their goal is and kind of reverse engineer the process to get there. But yeah, I mean, that's ultimately all that matters is are they getting what they need to get? Yeah, like I told you, we're trying to track and measure outcomes right now. And so we, we look at two types of outcomes, the sea level outcome. Sorry, I thought my voice must be loud enough. <laughs> so we look at two types of outcomes, the sea level outcome that we all talked about revenue, in, increasing revenue, reducing costs, mitigating risk. But then there's operational outcomes because a customer of ours is gonna buy one of our security solutions because they wanna identify and remediate malware as quickly as possible. That's what the executives want. The guy that's gotta implement that technology has a whole different set of outcomes that he or she wants to achieve in accomplishing that. So ultimately, the KPIs that we measure have to 
determine are these operational outcomes being met, and ultimately, did the corporate outcome get met? Right. Ideally, they should. One should be leading to the other, right? Yes. And and that's where I go back to you know in rather complex setups, you may have multi, you probably will have multiple personas that each have their own desired outcome. We need to know what those are. And you may have personas that have nothing to do with the actual product. I mean, maybe we need to report to finance every every six months. Maybe there's just other other people involved in you know that need to know things that we we need to provide some sort of visibility for. So it's critical again that we know. When I say we need to know our customers better than they know themselves. I mean, there are situations where we might say, you know, hey, by the way, best practice is to bring in this this team also, and provide a facility to, to make that actually work. How often do you advise the audience um, to revisit what are their business uh, desired outcomes every year, or once you've accomplished? the original ones? What if the client had been with you for five years and you've never asked them about the business outcomes? Would you still have that conversation? Uh, when, when, I, when I start working with the client, we, we do two things. We kind of figure out what we need to do going forward and draw that line in the sand and say, this is what the, the experience is gonna be for customers going forward. And then we look at existing customers and figure out, you know, we might end up actually segmenting those existing customers. You know, those, somebody that was with us five years and is doing fine, you know, we may we may go ahead and and just let them let them be fine, but we we're probably going to come up with different cohorts within that existing customer base. Some that that came on when we had no onboarding, some that never told us told us their goals. We're going to have to address that appropriately. You know, it's not. I mean, a lot of people have hid have hidden from their customers for a long time, and then they all, they want to start doing customer success, and it's like, okay, we have to kind of tread lightly here, not because we're we're going to cause a bunch of customers to realize they're paying us and go churn, but we just need to a, a, approach them appropriately. So existing customers are, are, are one thing, and, but we can say going forward, any new customers that come in, this is the experience that they're going to get. We're going to manage expectations properly from the beginning. We're going to get their goal. And you know how often we need to realign, re, realign with them depends on, on what it is. Do some monthly, some quarterly. Uh, I don't think I... Where we talk about that kind of thing, I don't think we've ever done anything more than, like you've ever gone more than a year. I mean, you would definitely want to realign. Yeah, but you also- know, I think that's actually absolutely probably true, is because most companies once a year realign as to what is their strategy for the year, or what is the company's goals for the year. And year over year, the company situation might change. One year, they could be in high growth. The other year, they're stabilizing, so they're very focused on costs. And a CEO would do that. And that ultimately might change your executive sponsor's way of thinking and priority year over year, specifically at the beginning of, year, of the year, their fiscal year. So that's always a great time to just double-click and check whether their business outcomes or desired business outcomes have changed. It could be that they never change. It's just more of it. I think the other um, thing that I've run into that's relevant here is, like if you're upselling and cross-selling, their business outcomes ideally are changing, right? So, I mean, I think to me that's a customer success job, looking at what else you can do. So, I've achieved this business outcome in six months. What's the next thing we can do for you and how are we gonna measure that outcome? I mean, it can be the same, but it can be like really different. Too. Well, I think, so we need to, so going back to knowing our customers better than they know themselves, I, I need to be at least thinking about, if I don't if I don't know this already, what is the most logical next step? Once they achieve a particular milestone, where do they need to go? And, and so whether that's through expansion or whether that's just, you know, the, the most logical use of the product that they already bought, you're, you're right. Sometimes somebody will say to me, you know, our, our customers churn out after a year. I don't, I don't get it. Some of you probably heard me say this before. You know, I, I don't get it. Why does that happen? Nothing changed. Well, right, with you, but your customer changed. And in fact, your value prop, the whole thing, the whole reason they did business with you, the thing that you sold them on was that they would change, that they would grow, that they would whatever, evolve. And then you're shocked when they do. <laughs> right? And so we need, to, we need to take that into consideration. So I, I always say customer success management so my definition is it's the process of moving the customer from, or it's a process of moving the customer to their ever evolving desired outcome. Just kind of trying to keep that top of mind that our customers are not are not stagnant, and and we need to keep that in mind. Um, yes. 
to some extent, how often you do this uh, you know, checking in with the customer depends on the type of business you are in and what are the desired outcome is. Well, if you have a yearly or annual renewal or whatever, I mean, if, you, if you're only doing it once a year, then it's sometimes too late. Absolutely. So we, that's what I mean. For your situation, that makes total sense. There are sometimes time-based reasons to reach out. So, you know, if you do business with higher ed, you know, for example, they have a very specific buying process, you know, when they start planning and when they actually buy. And so, you know, you may, based on that, the, the trigger of that event happening, uh, sort of external to their use of your product, are they, you know, do you reach out and start start having that, uh, that planning session? So, I mean, I, I I agree. I mean, but I would think that also, you know, there's going to be other there's going to be other triggers that might cause a, a reason to resync on things. Maybe it's even in the in the industry, right? A you know a, bre a data breach happens or something. That's a reason to just reach out to your customer. Not that it happened with your customer, but to realign, make sure they're they're good. So there, we have to be aware of all those different things. The sponsor may have left the company. Yeah. Have to no, that, that's another. The yeah. The, in, so there's 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 something that we always try to do, which is have uh, we call it the three by three um, contact redundancy. <laughs> um, just always making sure that we have multiple um, lines of communication into a company. A little hack that I like to do is uh, uh, I don't do many hacks, but what I like to do is um, get emergency contacts. Um, you know, just ask. You know, can I get an, an, a second emergency contact in case something happens? It's amazing how the way that we phrase things, people are willing to do that. And now I have another contact in case this guy leaves. So. One last uh, question. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to get your opinion on how to differentiate client success health scores between the buyer and the user. Because our buyer is typically not our main user. So what their goals are and what means success to them is definitely not in line with the main users of our product and what's most interesting to them. So do you have separate health scores? Do you have a combination of health scores? Just anything? Yeah, I mean, I think you may, I, it, there's probably different ways to, to look at that. I think we need to understand what the desired outcome is of the different personas is kind of the way I would look at that. If it's the buyer and they just need to know that they're getting an RI or that people are actually using it, then, then maybe that's just a report that we send out. It has nothing to do with customer health. It's just, it's just a report that we would give them. We're not, we're not going to be able to get anything, you know, they're not using the product, we're not getting anything from them, it's just more of a report that we, we have to provide. The end user, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a key persona, right? That, that's often very important. What do they need to achieve? What, and really, it comes down to understanding their job. And this is why I say go, go sit with them. You know, when was the last time you saw how they actually do their job? Where do you fit into their world? It's cool to be able to tell, you know, to, to come up with some, some goal for the use of your product as if your product is the most important thing in the universe. It is the most important thing in your universe because that's what you work with every day, but maybe it's not with them. And so we need to understand how they actually do their job. What, is, what do they need, what do they need to, to actually have happen to be successful? And if you're gonna build a health score around that, which is fine, build it around that. What needs to happen for them to feel successful? Now that may differ from a health score that's sort of a roll up of of everything for the, the company to know that they're getting, you know, that they're on the right track towards their goal as a company. But I, I wouldn't worry about so much calling it a health score at that point. I just, you know, I want to know, are they doing what's necessary? And, you know, are they, are they being taken care of in, in the way that is appropriate? Are there, you know, maybe that is where we say if they're opening support tickets and stuff, that's really important. Well, did you feel like you were taken care of tonight? Big round of applause to Lincoln for taking care of all his success. All of the inspiration he's bring to you. I love the way he's calling.